Good morning. Good morning. Good Praise morning. the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God is good. God is worth to be praised. Yes. Truly, if it wasn't for him, I don't know where I'd be. God is our refuge. Yes. Very present help in the time of storm. And for that we are thankful. We come to bless his name. If you could just think about all the ways he's made. Yeah. Thank you. 
We give God all the praise and all the glory. We thank him for his mercy, for his grace, for his favor, for his love. Thank you, praise King, for blessing us today. Lord, we praise you and we honor you. There is none like you. We pray, God, for preaching grace this morning. We ask, God, that you would open our hearts and our minds so that we can be both responsive and receptive to the ministry of the Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining those who are watching us via Facebook Live. We say hello to you. Thank you for joining us at the church at Gang Street where we are here worshiping and praising our good and gracious God. This is Palm Sunday. This is the Sunday leading up to the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining us via live streaming. Those who are watching from far and near, we pray God's blessings upon your life and upon your household. To the very few of you who are gathered here today, it's good to see you. Thank you for practicing social distancing. Uh, we're going to be reopening, a soft reopening on Mother's Day. I'm going to give you some more of the guidelines for that uh, near the end of the worship experience. Uh, Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15, verses 33 through 41. Mark chapter 15, verses 33 through 41. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the younger and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. I want to talk about the great transfusion. The great transfusion. Everyone loves the traditional Hollywood ending. The hero gets the girl, rides off into the sunset, to the adoring gazes of his fans. In our 
idealized world. That's how we want every story to end. Just a reminder, real life is not like the movies. If any man, whoever lived, deserved the title of hero, it was the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, according to Isaiah 53, he didn't have leading man looks. He didn't have heroic, selfless followers. He didn't have money. He didn't have earthly power. Didn't drive a fancy sports car. In fact, there was nothing about Jesus that made him stand out from his fellow Jews. Yet, I submit to you that the world has never seen a greater hero than Jesus. Jesus left his home in heaven, invaded the world, his arch enemy's territory, to redeem people from their sins. Jesus Christ, who was and is and ever shall be God, came to this world and became a man. He lived a sinless life, perfectly keeping the laws of God. Then he was rejected by the very people he came to save. Jesus came into this world to provide a way for the lost to be saved. And in order for him to open this way of salvation, he had to be nailed to a cross and executed the innocent dying like the guilty. He's rejected by the Jews. They accused him of blasphemy. They declare that he's worthy of death. They beat him. They bound him. They took him to Pontius Pilate. Pilate refused to, 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 to free him. Pilate upholds the death sentence, turning Jesus over to soldiers to execute him. These soldiers take Jesus. They mock him. They beat him. They led him away to a place called Calvary where they nailed him to an old rugged cross on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross the songwriter says the emblem of suffering and shame and I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I'll cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Our text opens with Jesus Christ on that cross. And by the time we get to verse number 33, Jesus has been on the cross for three hours. And during those first three hours, he has suffered all the pain that cross could give him. During that time, Jesus had also been mocked by jeering crowds. Those first three hours were a time of pain degradation, shame. During that time, human creation had its way with the Creator. The God who made man out of the dust of the earth 
was dying for sin on a cross right in front of them. And they had no more compassion for Jesus than they would for a dog run over in the streets. Up to this point, Jesus has suffered greatly at the hands of man, and now it's time for him to suffer at the hand of his own father. The cross was not about man having a chance to attack God. The cross was about God having a chance to attack his son for the sin he was about to die in place of sinners. I see several things about this text. First, I see the misery of his death. The misery of it. Jesus had been on the cross for some three hours. Nails have been driven through his hands and his feet. The nails passing through his hand would have been close in proximity to what they call the median nerves, which would have caused acute spasms of pain to shoot through the Lord's body. The muscles of his body would be cramping from dehydration and from being forced to remain in such an unnatural position for such a long period of time. The spasms in his body would have caused his back, which had already been sliced open from the beating the night before, to scrape against the wood of the cross. We can only try to imagine the agony that he endured that day as he died for us on the cross. But watch this. By noon, the Lord's physical suffering was not even close to being over. By the sixth hour, he had endured inconceivable physical agony, but his spiritual suffering was just now getting ready to begin. Because we're told that there was a darkness over the whole land from the sixth to the ninth hour, from 12 o'clock noon to three o'clock in the afternoon. After humanity had abused and shamed God's Son, God the Father now comes along and turns the lights off. This was not an eclipse of the sun that would have been impossible at Passover uh -uh, because, because the Passover is held just after the full moon. So it couldn't have been an eclipse of the sun. This was not natural darkness. This was a supernatural darkness. It also appears that this darkness was not worldwide darkness, but it was localized only in Israel. And my question is, why did God cause this darkness to fall on Israel that day? That's what I want to argue. I want to offer a few possibilities, a few reasons that darkness was over the earth. I think one reason has to do with the people who were around the cross. Because for three hours, they laughed at him, they mocked him, they stared at him as he hung in nakedness and in shame. Now God brings about a dense darkness to prevent them from seeing what he was about to do to his own son. What Christ was about to endure was so holy that sinful humanity was not worthy 
to look upon it. Another reason has to do with ancient prophecy. Because the prophet Amos warned of the coming judgment of God against sinful Israel. In Amos 8 and 9, he says, And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord God, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I'll darken the earth in the clear of the day. You know, throughout the Bible, darkness has always been associated with judgment. And when God was about to pronounce judgment on his son for the sins of man, he turned the lights off so the people around the cross could see it. A third reason has to do with the curse of sin. Because the lost people are held captive in the darkness of their sins. The darkness that covered Israel Bible says it lasted for three hours. And as far as we know, that darkness silenced the people around the cross. And for three hours, there was little sound and little movement. And at that time, from the depths of that darkness, Jesus cries, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, to understand why Jesus made that terrible cry, we need to understand what was happening during those three hours of darkness. There was a great transfusion taking place. While Jesus hung on the cross that day, the sins of all mankind were being transferred to Jesus.